Good morning. Good morning. So thank you, Mark. And yes, I'm going to introduce you to what I call a good practice. I'm a little bit shy about calling it best practice. There are just so many established organizations in this group. And in the two months that I've been a member here, there are just so many competent people in this room. So I'm a little shy on this, but I want to introduce you to an approach that has been extremely good for the venture capital companies where we've gone in, purchased businesses, and had to build them up. We've had to um, promote people, we've had to take in new job entrants and train them real fast because our intent was to flip the business and sell it. It had to be successful real fast. So, when we talk about the onboarding gap, let me ask you, typically what happens if uh, in your organizations where you do not have a job that already has sophisticated training manuals and approaches in place, what happens to the employee when that new employee gets to their workstation? They are totally reliant, am I right, on a supervisor or other colleagues around them to introduce them to the job. And those people are very busy and may not always have the time. So, I want to ask you and share with me as organization developers, what is it that you hope for your new job entrance in your companies? What do you want them to have from day one, in week one? What do you think concerning how uh, they feel about employee interaction? And I'm intrigued to know how do you feel in your heart whether for those people who are left there to learn by trial and error, have you done your best to give them a good shot at being successful? That onboarding gap is the gap between a sophisticated sign-on process, and most of your organizations have a great sign-on process. But in the venture capital companies, when we bought organizations, we found it was necessary to presume that the people we employed were bright enough, had some communication skills and some writing skills, so that they could be proactive self-starters and relationship builders from day one. But what they needed was to have some kind of understanding of how to go about that. We were kind of, you know, uh, with fate and the good Lord and some help, we kind of stumbled into discovering because we were involved in so many different companies that every job can be examined from seven different x-ray points of view. And if you take each of those x-ray points of view, if you equip them with the things to do and the questions to ask, they can very quickly integrate uh, into the job. So then, what are those seven steps? Well, I've got a character here named Fuzz, who hopefully will do a better job of explaining it to you than I can. Hello, I'm Les Cowell, and thanks for joining us for this short presentation in which I introduce you to the seven things that apply to every job. All jobs, no matter what the job is, they apply. You can take a job and you can look at it from these seven x-ray points of view and quickly find out what it will take for you to be seen mastering the new job quickly. And the seven steps are these. One, environments. Two, flow. Three, frequency four, ins and outs, five, checklists, six, faults, and seven, patrolling. Yes, every job has an environment and can be defined as an internal environment, which are the things closest to you that take place in the specific space for the job. But every job also has external environments where you interact with things beyond the immediate job space. Every job has a flow. It has a beginning point, it has an end point, and there are process steps along the way. There are many processes that may start at different points, many that run in parallel to that main basic sequence. Every job has frequencies. There are things in the job that happen more frequently than other things. 
and there are many things that happen in the job so infrequently that it may take you quite a long time to learn how to perform them. For every process in the process flow, each process will have ins and outs, and these can be easily identified. Each process has materials, parts, components, uh, people, systems. There are things that you need in order to apply the steps in the process to produce the required output, which may be products, it may be information, it may be a host of different things that move on to another processing point or get used immediately by other people. So it's important to understand the ins, the outs and the processes that must be applied to them. In practice people find that it's really valuable to create checklists for the very critical processes. Checklists help to learn how to perform the job in the correct sequence and to the correct specifications. Then, unfortunately, but it happens, every job has faults. And these faults may happen at random, but what is interesting is that some faults happen more frequently than others. And if you can get on top of those, this will help you master your job quickly. Now since you learn how to do the job correctly, and you learn how to recognize when the job is running correctly, and since faults happen, it makes sense that if you patrol the area of your job, whether that's a geographic space or whether it's a computer monitor and screen with information on it, by performing a patrol pattern and inspection sequence, you can anticipate and recognize when a symptom happens that warns you of a serious fault developing, and you can resolve it and fix it quickly. So, if you look at the job from these seven points of view, one environment, two flow, three frequency, four ins and outs, five checklists, six faults, and seven your patrol pattern and inspection sequence, you should quickly learn how to be successful in that job. So, in the handouts in front of you, I've provided the capture sheets for each of the seven steps. And you'll see that that's a blank sheet. And we're going to work with one of these later when we do the work, uh, workshop exercise. On the back of each sheet are the things to do and the questions to ask that we found, folk, that we found were necessary for a job entrant and ask. The environment, we encourage people to do a quick geographic layout. Uh, here in the case of a survey in a restaurant, it's the layout of the restaurant. Or for a technician, it could be a workshop. But we encourage people now in the days of smartphones to take pictures of your workspace area and in fact even identify what are the things that are essential that you're going to need in the job, especially in the case of applications, software applications, what are the applications I'm going to have to learn and what are the user's IDs and the passwords and those kinds of things. Then learning the internal and the external environment. In the internal environment, and I'm picking here Chief, Chief Executive Officer so that we don't think it only applies to technicians and administrators, but the Chief Executive Officer deals, yes, obviously with his staff, but also with bankers, auditors, and so on. Somebody new, even into that job, needs to understand what do I need from these people? What do they need for me? That's the in initial introduction very quickly to the culture. If we look at the external environment for a chief executive, it's customers, and if it's a public company, it's shareholders, market makers, business media, board of directors, auditors, vendors. The chief executive has to get involved not only in his internal world, but his in external world. So in any job, we need to introduce that, and parts of the reasons of that, going back to the first contribution I had there, is to help the employee quickly become familiar with the workspace. Start relating to the colleagues around them and understanding how to interact, and also from the external point of view, to avoid some corporate embarrassment. Does it make sense that being introduced to the environment is a value for job entrance very quickly? Some hands? I got some hands. Well, the next one then is flow. And sure, flow 
is the first visual picture that's an introduction to the workflow in the job. Uh, I check out and I buy groceries and I discovered that, hey, cashiers at a supermarket do more than just charge me for the weight and the quantity of what I buy. There's a lot in their job and somebody coming new into that job can be confusing unless they get a quick visual picture of the workflow which is the environment that they're going to work in. Then the next thing is frequencies and those of us acquiring businesses discovered that this is something we implemented. Not many organizations that we bought into had any consideration of it. How many of you have heard of the Pareto Principle? Yeah, well, the Pareto Principle says that in any activity, 20% of the elements repeat themselves 80% of the time. So um, from our sales and marketing people, we learned that, hey, 80% of the income typically comes from about 20% of your customers. 20% of your products typically get demanded 80% of the time. 20% of the raw, raw materials, parts, components, therefore, are needed about 80% of the time. And we were kind of forced into looking at the job because we had to train people real fast to be productive. Well, if we could identify the 20% of things that happened 80% of the time, we could look at the initial job focus we could get them productive by teaching them at least the 20% real fast. Then we discovered, well, that's not quite enough because when you get to these low frequency items, there may be something that impacts customer satisfaction, safety, quality, or union rule that is really critical. And so we found that actually it stretches to about 25%, I don't have a scientific answer to that, it's empirical, but teach 25% of the job and how? We discovered we were getting people 85 to 90% productive, just with a simple process, a simple approach, a simple philosophy. And it just delivered results for us. Once they've got that insight and perspective, you've got to get them down to drilling down to the details of the job. And that's when it comes to the ins and outs. And so you saw what we decided to use, and if anybody here is an engineer or an IT person, you may recognize the systems diagram for ins and outs, feed forwards and feedbacks. The ins and outs, this one is a training officer. And these are the things that a typical training officer does. But the training officer needs certain inputs to apply the processes in the job, like year, compile class content, design class schedule, you know, develop the, the class control systems. So every job has to have ins and outs and steps to perform. What we discovered many companies don't do is they don't teach the feedback and they don't teach the feed forward. Feedback, when you're in a technical, mechanical job, there are digital devices, mechanical devices that give you feedback. But in administrative jobs, it's quality control reports, accounting reports, every job has feedback. But what we found most companies don't teach is the feed forward. If you've got somebody and you want them to be productive quickly and excellent, then let them know what the job requirements are, the output requirements, the time requirements, the quality standards. Those are the feed forwards. When the person can measure the feedback against the feed forward, they've got the job in control. Then we found many of our, our companies then started using this format as a one page job description. Instead of the five, 10, 12 page job descriptions, you get in one picture, you get a picture of the whole job, including its controls. And you get a methodology for capturing the detail of the job. Then checklists. Nobody understands a checklist better than a, a, a pilot or an astronaut or a doctor or a nurse. We found that it was necessary to encourage people to develop checklists. And you can understand if you've done the ins and outs chart in detail, the checklist is just a reformatting of it. Here we see an example in a word format and you see it's in a trifold format because then you're able to print it out and it's a quick reference item that actually can be put right where the job takes place and it's always there for a quick lookup when you need it. But better still, 
It's just better to even have it on one of these devices. And we're working on that as well. Then, faults. And we're going to spend a little time on this one. This staggered us. Most companies, even those with sophisticated training programs, do not have a section in the syllabus for training fault, diagnosis, and correction. In a job, things go wrong, as, as first told us. And things go wrong, 20% of the faults happen 80% of the time. So, teach those faults, and boom, you can get people in command, in control of a job, really so quickly. You can teach them then, this was the other thing we found, our best executives, managers, or operators if they did a patrol pattern and inspection sequence, they naturally moved around. So we found if we could encourage job entrants to get off their butt, move around their territory, and then anticipate the faults, that way they could be in control. Now, we are shortly going to go to page six. It's, uh, it's uh, number six, faults. It's the second last page in your handout. And at your tables, we're going to do a quick exercise. Understand with a fault, with a fault you need to know the probable cause and for each of the probable causes, because there might be more than one, you need to have the correct corrective action. For example, if you go to the doctor with a pain, you don't want the doctor to rush you into surgery when he can actually treat you with medication, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, what you need to do is make sure that you identify the probable causes and for each probable cause how to fix it, and then what is the symptom. So I'm going to ask you now at your tables to turn to that number six, faults, appoint somebody at your table as a table leader to take notes and to be the person who's going to stand up and give us the feedback of your result. And then on a separate pad, I'd like you to just to pick an occupation, an occupation you know. Maybe it's an OD executive or an HR executive or a VP of sales or a salesperson or a training officer. And then just make a list of five things that could possibly go wrong in that job. And then I'd like you to, to write one of them, just one of them, in the first column of that page six false. When you've written it down, then it's time for coffee talk. Talk among yourselves, and I'd like you then to identify for that fault what could be the possible causes, and just some quick bullet points, what could be a corrective action for each of the possible causes. Then, talk about what could be the symptom that you can recognize, because when you do the patrol pattern and inspection sequence, what you're looking for is the symptom so that you can anticipate that a fault's about to happen and fix it before it costs you money. So, it's coffee talk time. Get going. I'll move around. If you have any questions, stick up a hand. I'll come and help. So we are HR executives. Yeah. And so we went way out on the land there. And we said that our Fault is poor hiring. That's a fault. The symptoms are turnover, both voluntary and involuntary. And the symptoms are poor performance. Awesome. So probable causes, unclear job descriptions, unclear expectations from the hiring managers. Probable causes are process in the interviewing and selection and screening process. So some corrective actions might be to add a realistic job preview uh, segment to the hiring process, redesign the process with additional behavioral questions and situational questions, and also add perhaps some assessment center type elements uh, for scenario based uh, activities. Those might be some corrective actions. Oh, let's give them a look. Well, thank you, thank you so much to that group. You have all helped me. You t people here have taught me stuff. There's so much competence in this room of the groups. This has been the most valuable exposure. And I would encourage those of you who are here for the first time, keep coming. 
This group will deliver for you over and over and over, many, many times. So, uh, for those of you, I mean, you've had just a little taste. In 30 minutes, it was so difficult for me to squeeze everything in. But those of you who sense that there's value in these seven steps and approach, um, they're there, you can follow them, uh, you can make photocopies of those forms, you can use them. Any of you setting out to actually give it a try, um, obviously there's some resources, the, the books, the, that's for the job entrant, this one is for the in-company mentors, I recommend you train in-company mentors, you don't have to appoint a special training officer to do this, but if you are setting out and you're a member of the Goodwill Network, don't hesitate to email me or just call me. I'll be very happy to talk you through and help you through it. Let me tell you, you'll find with your first one, it'll be a little bit clumsy and cumbersome. Your second one will be a delight. Your third one will blow you away and you will discover that supervisors, managers and executives are surprised at suddenly what's happening. And your new job entrants, you will discover, are not only being productive fast, they're interrelating, they, they're understanding the culture and participating. They are just delivering for you and they hang around longer. Um, I assure you that this is a good practice. I tell you, as venture capitalists putting money into businesses and being successful, we found it is a great practice.